Hello, today's reading is from Ephesians chapter 4 and it's verses 7 to 16. And it says this. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now, as anyone who's ever had teenagers at home knows, or anyone who's ever been a teenager, uh, growing up is a very painful process. I remember well those difficult years when nothing seems to go right. Your hair is greasy, you're all spotty, your body is doing all kinds of weird and horrible things, your hormones are rushing around all over the place, and you're suddenly realising your place in the world that perhaps the world doesn't completely revolve around you after all, and that you're actually a very small fish in a very large pond. But also I think the teenage years are a really exciting time because you're growing, you're learning, you're exploring, you're figuring out who you are and what life is really all about. And also you're beginning to take responsibility, you're becoming mature, you're beginning to use your God-given gifts and fulfil some of that amazing potential. And part of the process of parenting is helping our children to grow up, not keeping on spoon feeding them, but helping them to develop the skills that they're going to need out there in the big wide world. Helping them to develop into mature, independent adults who can stand on their own two feet. And the section of Ephesians that we've looked at today in chapter four is all about growing up, growing up in our Christian faith, attaining maturity. And as we've seen again and again throughout the book of Ephesians, it's not just about individuals growing up, just like he does in a few passages elsewhere, most notably in Romans and 1 Corinthians, Paul uses this picture of the body, the body of Christ to refer to the church the church as a body. Now, as modern Western Christians, I think we tend to think in quite an individualistic way. And so it's really important for us to notice when Paul is talking to the whole community of God's people, the body of Christ. And that's what this passage is all about. It's all about the whole body together becoming mature as it grows together, works together, builds one another up. And maturity, that means growing up, it means it's something that we do together as church. And actually that's true of our physical bodies as well, isn't it? It grows all together. It'd be a bit weird if we just had one bit of us, maybe our nose that was uh, a child's nose and the rest of our body was an adult's body. So we grow together as one body. So here Paul is writing to them as a group. He wants them as a group, as a church, to grow up together as one body, to become mature, to become unified, using their different gifts and skills to build up the other parts of the body. Until, as it says in verse 13, it says, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure 
of the fullness of Christ. That's quite a goal, isn't it? So, how are we going to do it? How are we going to grow up together? Well, Paul says, to help us do that, Christ has given to the church gifts. He's given us gifts. And we often talk about people as being gifted, don't we? We say, oh, they're a really gifted musician or they're a really gifted speaker and so on. But the gifts Paul is talking about in this passage are actually the people themselves that Christ has given to the church. So I'm just going to have a look at verses 11 and 12. It says this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now I'm going to stay with these verses for a bit because I think they're really important. First of all, I'd just like us to have a bit of a think about what these words all mean. First of all, we've got apostles and prophets. And um, they've already been mentioned several times in the book of Ephesians. In fact, Paul talks about him being an apostle right at the beginning in verse one of the whole letter. And of course, the word apostle means sent one, one who is sent. And it seems to be used throughout the New Testament to refer particularly often to those who are eyewitnesses to the resurrection or to those who have a special ministry sent specifically by Jesus and kind of the founders of the New Testament church. Prophets, of course, are there throughout the Bible, and they are those who speak God's revelation to the people. Often we think of prophecy as being about telling the future, and there may be elements of foretelling in the things that they say, but most of all, being a prophet is about telling the truth, about revealing the truth about God's heart, what God is saying to the people. And sometimes this has elements of judgment, elements of warning, calls for repentance. Um, and often as well, it has elements of comfort. Often it has both, if we think of the prophet Isaiah. And prophets throughout the Old Testament and the New are key figures in the life of the people of God. In the Old Testament, we might think of people like Samuel, Deborah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. In the New Testament, various people are named as prophets, including Anna. Do you remember her? She was at the temple when Jesus is brought there as a baby. John the Baptist is a prophet. Um, we've also got in the book of Acts, we have named the four daughters of Philip as prophets. And there's a guy called Agabus as well, who's who's um, mentioned as a prophet. Now, in the book of Ephesians, we've already seen Paul refer to the apostles and prophets together a couple of times. And I think if we look at this a bit more closely, it can help us to understand their role. So in chapter two, verses 19 to 20, um, we get this. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So you see that apostles and prophets are mentioned together as kind of the foundation of the church on which the church is built on. And then in chapter three, verses five to six, we get this. In reading this then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. So for Paul, the apostles and prophets are really important because they are the ones to whom the truth about who Jesus really is has been revealed. And they have a really important role, like the foundations of a house, if you like, or like the central nervous system of the body, establishing and shaping the church as this diverse multi-ethnic group, which includes both Jews and for the first time, Gentiles, non-Jews, as part of the people of God. 
Now, there's a bit of a debate today about whether people can still be apostles and prophets in their ministry. And what I would say is that, you know, in the New Testament, it certainly looks like apostles were seen as a particular group with a special calling at the time of Paul. But I certainly believe that people today can have ministries that could be described as apostolic and that there can also be prophets today. So we've got people who are like sent ones today. They're called to a particular place or people group and they're called to tell the prophetic truth about God's heart for those people. Maybe to bring words of warning or judgment, to call people to repent, to shape the vision as well of what God is doing, to act as like the foundation stones for the church in a particular place to be built up out of and to grow out of. So that's the apostles and prophets. And then we have evangelists. Now, what does that word mean? An evangelist is just someone who has such a passion for seeing people come to know Jesus that they can't help but tell people the good news about him. Those of you listening who are Welsh speakers might know that the Welsh word for gospel is evangel. And this comes from the same root as the word evangelist. So evangelist really means a gospeler, a good news person, someone who can't help but gossip the gospel wherever they go. And to a certain extent, this is something we're all called to do. But in my experience, there are certain people who have a real gift for this. They just do it naturally without fear, without having to push themselves. I don't know, you might know people like that. We often think when we think of an evangelist as someone like Billy Graham and people in the public eye. But actually, evangelists don't have to be preachers. They can be all kinds of people, all ages, often just quietly going about their daily business under the radar. But they just tell people about Jesus everywhere they find themselves, wherever they go. And then we have pastors and teachers. And these are people generally who we might think of as being a bit like the local church minister. Pastor, that word just means shepherd. Someone who looks after the flock, cares for them, helps people to grow in their faith, helps those uh, sheep just not to wander into prickly thorn bushes or onto a busy road. And then we have teachers. Teachers have a really important role explaining this strange book that is the Bible helping people to understand it, see what it means for our lives. And I'm sure you can think of people that have gifts in those areas and we thank God for each one of them. So each of those people with their different giftings are given to us by Christ as gifts for the church. But let's look again at verses 11 and 12. So it says, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Why? Why did he give them? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And what I want you to notice there is that the gift of those wonderful people is not to do everything all by themselves. So you might be sitting back now quite comfortably thinking, oh, well, I'm not an apostle. Don't think I'm a prophet, I'm not an evangelist, really. I don't like doing that very much. And I'm not a natural pastor. I'm not a teacher. So I'm OK then. That stuff is for the minister to do, maybe the deacons. The minister's supposed to do all that stuff anyway, aren't they? Because, well, that's what we pay them for, isn't it? And so I just get to sit here and get fed. And then when I'm ill, the minister and the deacons can come and visit me and pray for me. And when I die, they can do my funeral. Great. That's what the church is all about. People at the front and then the rest of us. But that's not what it says. If you have another look at verse 12... Why has God given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers? It says they are given to equip 
God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And another way of translating that verse is to equip his people for the work of ministry. For the work of ministry. That's everyone's work. It's the work of the whole body of Christ. Spoon feeding is what we do for babies. Sadly, sometimes you hear people say, oh, I stopped going to church or I stopped going to that church because I didn't get anything out of it. And I can see that it's important to be in a church where the Bible is being taught, where there is depth, where you're really learning. Yes. But too often we just expect the church to be a place where we simply consume, where we are served. And true, yes, sometimes church is a place where we are served. It should be. When we're ill, when we're struggling, we can lean on our brothers and sisters. We can ask for help. We can ask for prayer. Yes, that is church. But church is, or it should be also, a place where we grow up, where we grow in our faith, where we grow into maturity as Christians, where we learn how to read and understand the Bible for ourselves, where we learn how to care for one another with the love that we ourselves have received from Christ, where we develop the gifts that we have been given, where we are equipped, where we are challenged, where we can all become ministers. Spoon feedings for babies. But Paul doesn't want us to be babies anymore. He wants us to grow up He wants us to take responsibility. He wants us to be mature in our faith. And Paul sees the danger of churches that are just full with a load of baby spoon fed Christians. And it's a dangerous place to be. If you look at verse 14, it says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. And we see it over and over again, don't we? It comes in the news. How easy it is in a church full of baby Christians for a controlling and misguided leader to just take everyone with them in completely the wrong direction. As a church leader, I want to be, I need to be surrounded by people who are mature, who are becoming mature, or at least have a desire to become mature, to learn, to take responsibility. I need to be surrounded by those people to help me, to correct me. In our Baptist churches, we have a tradition where the church members come together once a quarter to discern the mind of Christ together. And this is a great thing. If we are all, as church members, if we're all growing up, if we're all becoming mature, then we can sharpen one another, we can correct one another and we can collectively encourage one another so that we don't go off on the wrong way. We all grow together as a whole body and this is what helps us maintain our unity as the body of Christ in this place. Moving on to verses 15 and 16. Instead, speaking the truth in love We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. If you look at those two verses, they both talk about love. And I just want to emphasise the love in this process. Verse 15, we speak the truth in love. I know a few people, and I'm sure you do too, maybe you're one of them, who pride themselves on being plain spoken, telling it like it is, being blunt. And this is good. This is great. But we need to do it in love. Or we need to just keep our mouths shut. Because if we're speaking the truth in bitterness, if we're speaking the truth in resentment, if we're speaking the truth in jealousy or even in hatred or in ungodly anger, 
then that will not build up the church. We speak the truth in love. And I also know some people, and maybe I am one of these people, who speak in love, but we want so much to be liked or accepted or to keep the peace that we don't always maybe tell the truth. Speak the truth in love. This is what builds up the body of Christ. And I think all of us have a tendency to fall one side or the other. Do we need more truth? Do we need more love? But truth and love have to be completely linked together. And we need to honestly come before God and ask him to help us get the balance right. So this growing up, growing up as Christians can be a painful process. But Paul underlines that it needs to be done in the context of love, of sharing a deep, deep love for one another, whatever our gifts, whatever stage we're at in our Christian journey. We need that deep concern for one another, that desire to see one another grow and develop in our walk with God. And I long to see the churches where I preach grow, but not just in terms of bums on seats, because true growth is about depth, about, it's about growing up in Christ. Wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you might be very new to this. You might still be on baby food and you know that is okay. That's okay. But what is not okay is when you get Christians who've been there for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years or longer and they never get beyond the baby food stage. And that is a tragedy, that is a waste. So let's at least have that desire to grow and develop and get beyond that so that we're pushing more and more into that maturity that God has for us, that God has for us all as a whole church. Verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith, and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we want to grow up. We want to become mature in our faith. We want to be able to correct one another, to speak the truth in love to one another to build one another up so that we can all reach that maturity and the fullness of Christ, the whole measure of the fullness of Christ sounds like such a lofty goal and one that maybe we would struggle to reach but Lord it's what we desire, it's what we desire in our hearts and so we pray that through, our, through your Holy Spirit and through the amazing people that you have put around us that you will help us to grow up in our faith and with one another. In Jesus' name, Amen.